Next up, we've got uh, Noah Falstein. He's a man who kind of needs no introduction, but that would be a cop-out, so I'll introduce him. Uh, I could say things like uh, Lucasfilm, Lucasfilm Games, or a man who's made arcade games for arcades, Commodore 64, DOS, Windows. He's uh, done it all. And now he's the chief game designer for the Android team at Google. Whatever that could mean. Uh, Noah Falstein. Hello. Give me a moment to make sure I'm uh, presenting here. OK. Um, I assume everybody can hear that. Can I see a wave of hands if everyone can hear me fine? Excellent. All right. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here virtually. I had uh, hoped to, to join you in person, but unfortunately, uh, the timing from GDC, where I gave this presentation last week, was just too tight. Um, but it's nice to be back uh, on, well, I guess both sides of the pond for the moment. Um, so I've, uh, I'll just dive in here. This is a talk I gave last week at our Google Developers Day at GDC. And uh, it's a, an extended version. That one was only about 15 minutes. And I'm going to go into a little more depth here. I may not uh, quite take my full time, but uh, generally being a little ahead of the schedule is uh, not such a bad thing at these conferences, particularly late in the day as it is for you over there. So I'll be talking a bit about evolution today. Uh, which is appropriate because, as has been said, I'm uh, something of a dinosaur in the games industry. I, I started uh, professionally making games in 1980 and, in fact, had dabbled at university uh, as early as four years before that. So uh, it's been a very long time making games and uh, very pleasurable, really. Uh, I have no complaints about that. It's actually kind of fun being a, an industry dinosaur. You you get to pontificate, uh, and uh, GDC becomes a, a great reunion. Um, but I'm going to actually go even farther back than the, the dinosaur era, which ended about uh, 65 million years ago uh, with uh, the asteroid everybody uh, has heard about. In fact, I'm going to go back to a time around 540 million years ago, something called the Cambrian Explosion. And the picture I'm showing now is one of an artist's conception of a lot of the sea creatures that were found. Uh, it was all sea creatures at that point. This was very, very short in geological time uh, after multicellular creatures first evolved. And as you can see, there are some really strange ones out there. In fact, uh, pretty much every single one that has been found in the, the Burgess Shale, where most of these fossils came from, is just bizarre and creepy to our eyes. Uh, you can't quite see the details, but one of my favorite ones there is a, a little fellow who has uh, five eyes and uh, a long tongue that ends in a claw. And it just looks like something somebody did on um, uh, some sort of drug trip. Uh, in fact, one of these creatures is named uh, Hallucinogena because of that. Uh, at any rate, the point I want to make is that pretty much as soon as it was possible for multicellular life to spread, it spread into just a wide profusion in every ecological niche. And that's a, a lesson that I think has a lot of um, relevance for us because it spread out. There were many different types of creatures. And then uh, perhaps it was another asteroid, perhaps some other kind of disaster wiped out, uh, I believe, about 80 or 90 percent of those life forms in a very short time. And then they, the ones that remained evolved, spread, moved into new ecological niches, and eventually also came out onto land and uh, became us. Um, this kind of rise and fall of eras has happened many times geologically. Uh, and in fact, it's very similar, I think, in a lot of ways to what we've seen in the games industry. Uh, I'm old enough to remember Pong when that was new, and even before that, uh, Nolan Bushnell's uh, computer space game that I thought was the coolest thing I'd ever seen when I first uh, was a teenager going into an arcade. I, I was expecting mechanical pinball games only, and suddenly here was this sleek cabinet with this uh, wonderful, um, well, I should have brought a picture of it, but uh, you should take a look at it. It was well ahead of its time, and in fact, he went to do Pong afterwards because it was so far ahead of his time, no one was ready for it. And that's a lesson we can learn from as well. But just as with the, the 
physical evolutionary rise and fall. We've seen that in the games industry many times. And uh, when I was doing arcade games, I worked on a game called Sinistar many years ago. And within a year of it coming out, uh, almost 90% of the audience for arcade games had just given up. It was a, a very quick fad that faded and happily uh, consoles and PC games quickly rose to, to take its place. Recently, we've had similar kinds of ups and downs with the social revolution and 100 million pl people playing uh, a game on, on Facebook or on uh, you know, other social services. We've had uh, that, that same kind of rise of indie developers. Uh, I asked this at GDC and nearly uh, two thirds of the audience consider themselves indie developers of one sort or another. Just a few years earlier, that was quite a rarity. And of course, we've seen the, the huge rise in mobile coming almost out of nowhere over the last five years or so. I had friends who were working on mobile games uh, 10 or 15 years ago and struggling in the uh, era at that point before, much like the Cambrian explosion, suddenly smartphones made it possible to have all sorts of great games out there. So what does that bring us to? Well, this is a bit of a cliche, but the Chinese character for crisis is made up of the characters for danger and opportunity together. And uh, it's just a wonderful metaphor, and I'm going to deconstruct that a little bit. I think it's still quite relevant, uh, even if it is a, a bit of a cliche. Um, first, what's the danger involved? Well, I think the real concern is that a lot of things are coming to an end. I've talked about cycles, and it's easy to talk about cycles from a, a calm, long-term perspective. But if you're the dinosaur caught up in an extinction, as, as uh, this fellow here, who's actually just uh, oh, about half a mile from me over at the, the main buildings in the Google campus here, um, then it can be a pretty terrifying thing. And uh, really, uh, uh, whoops, a lot of people believe that this might be our last big console cycle, that the, the PS4, the Xbox One, these are, uh, we're never going to see a, a big, expensive, dedicated console again. Personally, I'm not quite sure of that. You know, one thing that my experience has taught me is that it's really hard to predict exactly what will happen, and we've been surprised many times before. And yet I have to agree that uh, there are many reasons why I think that's a possibility. And uh, personally, I'm a bit relieved not to be betting everything I have on uh, not only the next consoles, but on one particular console. That's always a, a really nervous, uh, nerve-wracking place to be in. A, I'm sure some of you have experienced that. Um, Another thing that concerns a lot of people, I talked about social games having 100 million users, and largely a lot of those users have moved over to mobile now, and even mobile seems to be getting crowded. The future for that is uh, also a little bit murky, but there were many of my friends who were at Zynga and Playdom a few years ago, and virtually all of them have left those companies, uh, in fact, most uh, being made redundant at some point. Um, so it's pretty scary to, to see that coming you know, into being and seeming like the, the big new thing, and then within just a year or two, have it seem like uh, yesterday's news. It's a very scary thing that way. Um, some other dangers, the cost for mobile development, as with almost every new area, is climbing. Competition's quite fierce, and it's really driven up the, the lowest stakes there. If you really want to compete in a mobile game now, you need very high production quality, and of course that means longer time and more money to produce things. It is still possible you get your little Flappy Bird successes that uh, little in terms of development costs and big in terms of income. But of course, uh, that becomes rarer and rarer when you look at the, the huge numbers of people trying to get into that industry. So that's a bit of uh, cause for anxiety, if not necessarily doom and gloom. And it's not all technology or uh, game type. It's also the business model that's been disrupted. Free-to-play surprised a lot of people, myself as well, and not just that it was successful. It didn't surprise me that it was one possibility that worked quite well, but just like the uh, four-limb model of, of um, oh, humans and primates and, for that matter, mammals and amphibians and birds, uh, you know, so many of our creatures have a pretty similar kind of structure, and it seems that free-to-play is likewise spreading out to become uh, by far the most popular way to do mobile games these days, at least for monetization. 
Similarly, digital distribution and rentals are causing a lot of people concern and opening up opportunities for others. So none of this is new, but you take it all together, it's pretty scary. And there's also, of course, an ever-increasing choice of hardware. Uh, just so many different um, platforms out there, in addition to the big consoles and PC, you now have micro consoles, you have uh, lots of head-mounted displays, uh, everything from full virtual reality that we've seen from Sony or from Oculus Rift to uh, oh, gadgets like this one here that are uh, becoming popular. Uh, it's actually amazingly stylish uh, around where I am at the moment. Um, so let's move on to some of the positive side of that. There's really a lot of opportunity as well. Um, I think the way to look at this is that boundaries are really breaking down everywhere at this point. And that can be a scary thing, but it really opens up lots of new territory, lots of new possibility. So to start with, I don't think we've ever had a more lucrative time in all my history. Certainly, the industry is making more money as a whole than it ever did before. And uh, as early as about 10 years ago, people were trumpeting that games were finally making as much money as movies. And usually they had to compare the best games to uh, studio box office and not talk about video rentals or all the other ways that, that the movie industry cashed in. But increasingly, it's just becoming simply true that games are more lucrative than film. And uh, not only that, but show every sign of continuing to spread. If you look at games as a whole, a combination of all of the, uh, the different types of games out there. It's also, and I think this is even more encouraging, never been more popular and widespread. You know, this is a matter of, of global reach. Um, I travel a lot. I really enjoy speaking around the world. And it's amazing to me how even tiny countries with population of one or two million people sometimes have two or three different game development companies in them. And of course, uh, many other places like the, the UK or the US that have been doing it a long time. It's, it's just hard to count the number of uh, small and even uh, medium and large developers out there. So lots of um, widespread development, uh, lots of widespread game playing, and not just in terms of where in the world, but also who in the world is playing. We have younger people playing and sometimes than ever before. Tablets certainly have become a huge thing with uh, kids, uh, even as uh, younger than two years old. And uh, brain games, an area that I worked in some, is becoming increasingly popular with people in their 70s and 80s, you know, areas that we never really expected were going to be big for game playing and yet have become quite vital in some areas. Uh, Japan, I think at the height of some of the brain game boom, had over 80 different types of brain games out on the market, and many of them were quite uh, popular. Um, it's also, as I say, uh, with brain games, increasingly consequential. One of the, one of the things that I've also done uh, before coming to Google was work in the serious games or games for impact area, where the games have a purpose besides just entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with entertainment. I think it's it's a great purpose in itself. Uh, if anybody, by the way, ever is making games that are are fun and feels a need to kind of revitalize their their enthusiasm for, for just doing something that's fun. I'd recommend a movie called Sullivan's Travels from the 1940s. Uh, I'm just curious, I, I can see most of you there. Uh, how many people have seen this movie, Sullivan's Travels? Anyone? Okay, looks like not many hands. And not surprising, 1940s films aren't that popular, but I used to work with a, a fellow named Hal Barwood. We, we created uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis together. And Hal is a filmmaker, uh, actually, co-wrote uh, as a ghostwriter, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and worked on uh, half a dozen feature films that uh, I quite enjoyed. So he told me about Sullivan's Travels. It's a uh, uh, black and white film, uh, but a really good one if you're feeling a little bit uh, in need of encouragement about fun. And yet, beyond fun, games are helping, certainly in the medical area, they're helping uh, diagnose and treat people with brain injury and trauma. They're helping train uh, surgeons and uh, medical people of all types. But beyond that, there's uh, training and social uh, interactions in games that are helping uh, people, for example, with um, autism, learn how to better interact with uh, their peers. Um, lots of really exciting games out there. I'll, I'll be speaking at the Games for Change conference uh, next month about some of these things. So that's pretty exciting. 
And we've never quite been so connected in so many ways. Uh, there are more and more screens out there. I've got lots of tablets at home. Uh, of course, some of that is just because Google tends to shower us with, with devices to test. But even before I joined the company, they were starting to proliferate. And um, we're also connecting in different ways. Uh, this is a picture from a project I worked on with uh, Dr. Adam Ghazali. Uh, he was doing a game uh, called Neuro Racer that I, I had a small hand in. Recently got on the Journal of Nature, a very prestigious uh, science journal. First time that the journal, actually I think any major science journal has had a video game on the cover. But it's proven to be a great way to actually improve people's ability to multitask while driving, uh, not uh, driving and texting, but being able to drive and also see road signs and, and respond to those sorts of inputs, which tends to deteriorate as people get older. And yet with game training, it's shown that not only can 70 and 80 year olds get back to the levels that they were when they were 20 or 30, and this is measured through a combination of EEG that you're seeing there and fMRI, uh, but they also retain those gains six months later, which is just quite remarkable, even without playing the game anymore. So a lot of things games are doing to both connect directly to our brains and also to, to help uh, people in, in really consequential ways. We've never been on so many different devices and screens. I mentioned that before. Uh, Google's also announced initiatives for wearables, for uh, an automotive initi initiative to plug Android devices into displays in cars, uh, of course, uh, Google Glass, and there have been announcements of watches coming out uh, in the near future. All of this is really in our future. This has actually been a really useful device for me. Uh, I started testing it and have been amazed at uh, how handy it is to have around. And there's some really fun games that our, our New York office uh, made that are on there as well. And so what else? Uh, games have never really been analyzed in as much depth as they have by universities all over the place. So we really understand how games work, how they affect our brains, how games have evolved and how we have evolved to want to play um, from uh, even prehistory be before we were human. Uh, anyone who has puppies or kittens at home can see that play is a way that uh, young of many species learn. And in general, I think this is a positive thing, but of course it can cause some anxiety as well because I've just talked about all of these exciting things and I'm willing to bet that the large majority of you have only focused on one or two of these different areas uh, with, with all these new technologies coming out. There's just so much out there now, it's pretty much impossible for anyone to go into any depth across the whole breadth of, of all these things out there. So what can you do? Well. Again, I like to take some cues from uh, physical evolution. After the dinosaurs, as we all know, uh, little mammals, starting with uh, shrew-like creatures like this, this little fellow here, uh, proliferated, grew much larger, moved into various ecological niches, and in many ways were able to spread much farther than dinosaurs did and certainly uh, deal with a, a much wider range of temperatures and environments. And that's happened, as I said, over and over in, in the games industry. So what we can learn from that is that if you're flexible and you embrace change, it's a winning strategy pretty much every time. Uh, in fact, the, the whole cliche of dinosaurs, if you think about it, is sticking with the same sort of thing, getting bigger and bigger without regard to the fact that uh, you're getting more vulnerable even as you're getting more powerful sometimes. So another point, though, is that even though I'm using this analogy, we can actually change much faster than actual physical evolution that takes place over millions of years. Uh, we don't have to wait to you know, have the, the fittest survive. We can see something that works and graph those changes into our games as has happened with lightning rapidity for things like free to play pricing or the growth of um, social, mobile, any of these trends. We're actually getting faster and faster at adopting new trends. And I think that's very encouraging because being able to be uh, as flexible as that is a really good thing. And Google, I think, is in a great position to help developers with this. I don't know of any other company that is involved in as many different things. And as I'm sure you've seen in your presentations there today, this company is really committed to helping game developers. Uh, I've been with the company for about a year now, and it's been a real pleasure to see how much game development was actually going on. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> 
should have shut those down. Uh, how much game development is going on at Google in many different ways, but I've been uh, getting involved more and more with all sorts of new ways that uh, Google is getting into games. And games are one of those things that can spread through every type of technology. And as you can see with a lot of the presentations you've seen today, Google is into helping at every stage from the early production and research to uh, understanding how to build the games and giving you support for Android, Chrome, you know, a lot of different uh, platforms out there, all the way through getting it out there, getting your game recognized, and getting it monetized through advertising or you know, whatever method it is that you choose to use. Uh, Google is into so many different things, and as I said, I think every one of the things that I've got listed up here has game potential. And uh, I'm with a group, by the way, uh, our, our name within Google is the Fun Propulsion Labs, and you'll be hearing more about us in the fairly near future. Um, but we're very interested in the range and, and breadth of what Google is interested in and seeing if we can apply games to many of these different areas, as well as help you, the game developer community, by making uh, our tools for game development as good as possible. So I'm gonna conclude with a little bit about the future. I hesitate, as I said before, to be too positive because there is no one future. One of the things I've learned about the games industry that I love about it is that there are many, many different possible futures. Uh, this is a wonderful industry if you're open to change and reinventing yourself, and they're just, you know, you never get bored. There's always new stuff coming out, and never more in the la than in the last few years. In my 35 or so years in game development, this is just an extraordinary time. So here are some suggestions of what I think uh, will work for you. You need to be open-minded because it's so hard to see where the next hit will come from. You need to be willing to adapt and uh, see what new trends there are. And that's easier to say than it is to do. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a fad that will burn out quickly and a new trend that's coming along uh, to stay. Uh, for example, virtual reality was a big uh, topic back in the late 80s when I first experienced it. And the technology just wasn't quite there yet. It's coming on very strong now, and it feels to me like it's going to be very solid this time. And yet I know of a lot of people who get uh, physically ill when they put on a virtual reality unit of even some of the best uh, quality, so hard one to bet on. But staying open-minded means that you know, hey, even if a third of the people can't use it, that still leaves a huge number of people out there who might find it very worthwhile. Um, think globally uh, in all senses of that. You know, certainly in other parts of the world, there is huge growth in uh, Asia in particular, and I expect places like Africa, places that we don't really anticipate these days as huge game markets, but that could grow to be become them in the fairly near future. And also in established markets, there are sometimes new blue oceans of uh, new technologies that are going to spread and become very popular. When you, you see how smartphones have taken over in uh, Europe and the US, really all around the world, from very quick beginnings, uh, not very many years ago, you don't want to discount even established markets for having new areas to go into. And personally, I would suggest each of you Look to compete in areas that you're strong in, that you're good at. Each of you out there, I'm sure, has your own abilities, your own strong points. Uh, some of the stuff out there, as attractive as it is, won't be right for you, for your company, uh, for you as an individual. And other things will be perfect for you with the background you have, the interests you have. Uh, go with your passion, go with your interests, and go with your strengths. And it's hard to go wrong, even if there is a downturn in the industry, if you've done something that you're good at and that you're proud of, then I think that you'll be in good shape. And hand in hand with that, this is a really strong philosophy here at Google, you want to be agile and iterative. Uh, it's important, I think, to um, fail fast, to try new things. We see this on the game design side, side all the time with paper prototyping and other fast computer prototyping as by far the best way, instead of coming up with a, a detailed plan, 100-page design doc, built to that design doc, and then consider whether this is actually any fun or not. That really doesn't work. You really need to uh, be agile and iterate uh, very quickly. And in a similar sense, you want to diversify as, as much as is practical, uh, even if that's just a little bit, because sometimes teams are small and they can't afford much diversity. But better to have you know, one main thing you're doing and one small side project that could 
grow than to only put all your eggs in one basket and be stuck if that basket uh, uh, drops and you're, you're out of luck. Um, I know of a lot of game companies that have gone under because they bet everything on one throw of the dice and uh, often through a funding change or some circumstances totally beyond their control, it didn't work out well. Uh, the companies that have had several things going on at once are the ones that, much like the little mammals growing into the new slots, uh, new ecological slots, were able to succeed. Another thing that I would say that I've learned here at Google and is definitely true is don't bet against the Internet. Uh, I was skeptical about some always online multiplayer concepts because of the times that I would travel and be on a plane without Internet and a uh, recent inter international trip I had was the first one I went on where they had internet available the whole time. Um, it's getting harder and harder to find places where there isn't good internet availability. And even if you can still come up with circumstances where that's a problem now, it's a pretty good bet that in the future, probably the near future, it will increasingly become less and less of a problem and speeds will go up as well. So taking advantage of that is always a safe thing. Uh, and finally, I'd say Google really wants to help with this. This is a company that I'm very happy to say can benefit uh, indirectly. We don't have to uh, focus so much on the kinds of um, oh, direct revenue models that I was used to as an independent game developer uh, because it helps us if the whole industry prospers. And we hope that we'll be able to help you prosper because it'll really uh, be the rising tide that, that helps all boats. Uh, if I can add one more cliche in there. So that's it. Uh, this is my contact information, uh, my uh, email address and, and uh, Twitter feed. I'm also happy to connect with people on LinkedIn, but please don't send a generic uh, response. Just tell, tell me even uh, if it's simply that you saw me uh, through this presentation, that's, that's fine. And uh, I don't know if I'm equipped to take questions at the moment, but... Uh, uh, I don't think there's much time, so let's cut it off at that, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noah. It was great that you could uh, join us here today. Thank you very much, and we're intrigued to see what comes out of the Fun Propulsion Labs uh, when you make your announcements.